guys have no idea how challenging it is to put a presentation together where you talk about consistent cash flow in front of a room full of people that want to do 20, 30, 50, 100 baggers like Eric was talking about this morning. <laughs> but uh, I'm grateful to be here. Uh, love hanging around with guys like yourselves. I get to learn and stretch and grow. And uh, thanks for calling and Sean for put this event together and invite me. A few of you guys in the room have gotten my, e uh, my uh, newsletter emailed out a couple weeks ago where I talked about two of the books that made that had the biggest impact in my life in terms of business, taxes, government, investing. One of them was Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. The other one was G. Edward Griffin's Creature from Jekyll Island. I mean, you talk about connecting the dots for me. And, and uh, so I'm just uh, honored to be in the same room in Jekyll Island as G. Edward Griffin today. So um, my quote that I came up with here um, a few months ago, within the last year, has been popular in some circles, financial radio shows, and have been picked up. So I actually am in the process of getting a trademark. But I know that I don't have to explain that one to you guys. So. I'm in a warm audience on that one. There we go. So my friend Jim Rogers taught me a lot about investing in commodities. And um, as I remember a few years ago, quite a few years ago, I was uh, reading his book, Hot Commodities. And um, he taught me about how you can figure out the cost of a commodity. And then when you see the, the commodity going down, dropping down to the price, to where the price reaches less than the cost to produce it, that you should uh, become a buyer at some point in those type of situations. So I used his uh, strategy, the building on the left there. I've owned multiple businesses. And, and uh, the building on the left there is our family business. And uh, there was this product, it's, it's, uh, for, you, for those of you familiar with the building industry, uh, we use a lot of OSB. It's like a plywood product, and we use a lot of it. And we're shipping buildings all over the country. And I remember seeing the price of OSB slide from 12 to $11 to 10 to 5 you know, all the way down to 5 bucks. And I used the, the uh, information that I learned from uh, Jim Rogers to, at that point, jump in, and we I mean, that our, our building was overflowing with OSB. We bought just a, like 50 truckloads of the stuff, and we were storing it outside. And then within two years, um, it went back up to 14 bucks. And uh, so that was where I created my, that was kind of the first um, kind of addiction that I got to, uh, in, in investing in the commodity space and, and uh, sort of helped my, captured my interest ever since. So. After creating several um, very successful businesses, and we're, we're in the modular business back home, and we're shipping buildings all over the country and even internationally, um, I, was, um, I was also doing some private money lending. I was flipping houses and doing some short-term capital gain stuff and having all that, uh, just a whole ton of fun. But uh, I got to the point where one year um, I get the call from my CPA on April the 13th, saying that even after we did the, uh, you know, we took the depreciation on whatever we could, and you've paid your quarterlies, you still owe. In two days from now, you still owe several, several thousand, several hundred thousand dollars, and it just became not so much fun anymore. Um, I was taught from the time I was just a kid that when you make a lot of money, you have to pay a lot of tax, and so I believed that that was true. Even my CPA at the time was in that camp. Right? You just got to pay your dues. So when Robert Kiyosaki talked about making millions of dollars a year and not paying any tax, it drove me crazy. I was like, what, what in the world is he talking about? And I didn't think it could be done. But when I changed my, my the, the, the question became, how can I? Um, at that point, the kind of the world opened up to me. I was able to crack the code. And it happened by getting around him and his team. It happened by uh, getting around great mentors. I mean, I, I love getting around mentors. There's, there's a lot of white hair in this room. And I love, uh, you know, 
Look at this. You've got a bunch of guys a lot older than me, some of them no hair. Um, you know, I just, I love getting around folks like that that I can learn from and pick their brain and, and try to figure out uh, how I can advance and, and use what they've learned to um, head in the, in the direction I want to go. So, a lot of you guys uh, have seen uh, charts like this, hopefully not too many of them in your portfolio, but you know, to a lot of us it looks like opportunity. You know, it looks like uh, you know, the point where you get into the commodity space where you know that at some point it's going to turn, and it was sort of what happened to me in the OSB when I bought all the OSB. It turned and it went back up, and, and uh, that is really exciting. There, look, there's nothing as boring as a 250-unit apartment building with a 30-year mortgage, 10, 12 years fixed, and it just churns out cash every month. It just, but, but I, I actually have disciplined myself to not go in and be 100%. Because, look, I, I love the thought of, of uh, buying a whole pile of stock at 25 cents and watching it go up to three, four, five, 10 bucks. I mean, who doesn't like that? But I want to sleep at night. My wife and I have been married, we've been married for almost 20 years, 20 years in, in December, and we live in a really nice house on 22 acres, and we want to keep living in that house. And, and so I got to discipline myself to invest for cash flow and not go all in on you know, chasing uh, companies or investments that, with the hopes of uh, big gains. So we're going to talk about steady, consistent cash flow. We're going to talk about um, how you can keep that money, use, uh, use depreciation um, to get tax-free cash flow, and we're going to talk about diversification. So cash flow you can depend on, uh, and we're also going to talk about some deal flow and, and how you can put some of that. One of, one of the things that I'm most involved in right now is, and have been for the last, uh, you know, most of the last decade, is I started doing this for myself. I started building a portfolio. It was coming out of the Great Recession. I wanted to build something that would withstand another correction. And I did that for myself until I ended up running out of my own cash. There were still deals. There were still great deals in the market. So I started reaching out to family and friends saying, hey, look, we got a deal that's going to you know, return X amount of cash flow. Do you want to play? And it grew organically from there. Um, we're going to talk about investing for cash flow, tax sheltered, assets professionally managed, and leveraging the efforts of others. I mean, really what you're doing when you invest in the right kind of real estate, you are investing in, you're leveraging the efforts of others. Somebody's going to work, they're going to work all day, they're coming back at night, and you're getting 30% of their paycheck. And then infinite returns. Infinite returns is when you buy a multifamily building, you take the market appreciation plus maybe some forced appreciation. When you added value to the building, you can go back to the bank and say, okay, we bought this building for a million dollars and now appraise it for 1.5 million. You can get the property um, reappraised. You can pull, pull out your original capital and go with uh, non-recourse debt. And it's a really good way to get into an asset like this where you've got none, none of your own money in the, in the deal anymore. So my four rules for successful investing, and this, this has changed my life. This is um, the four rules that I live by uh, in investing. So knowing who I am as an investor, uh, knowing what's important to me is, uh, is critical. You know, I used to, you know, I, I was one, I'm an optimist. I, I believe that opportunities are only for optimists. If they were for pessimists, they'd call them pessitunities. So, you know, I'd see a deal, any kind of a deal, and it looked like there was gold there. I mean, it's just like, man, this, this, this just looks golden. But when you get really clear on what you want and what's important to me, what was important to me? And what was important to me was building additional cash flow streams, and I had a tax problem. So I went after an asset class that, that got me what I wanted. I didn't go to San Francisco or, or San Diego and go to, you know, high appreciating markets that don't cash flow, I went back to my personal philosophy and, and started building a portfolio that, that, that fit what I, what, I, what I needed. 
The second step is finding a market, and this applies more to real estate than probably anything, but finding a market that'll deliver number one, personal investment philosophy. Uh, third on the, on the list is team, and this can apply to companies as you, as you guys know. I mean, it, you know, I would, I would say that's, you know, maybe that we should be moved up uh, a notch or two there, but team, once I have the team in that marketplace, then I let them help me find the asset. And I mean, a lot of people do it just the opposite. They go find the asset, then they try to figure out who's going to manage it for you. And then you find out, well, it's not in the right part of the city. And as most of you know, the ones that look best on paper are the ones that normally are the hardest to keep occupied and stabilized. All right, here we go. I, I believe investing is a team sport. Um, most of the investing I do is with teams. We'll put a deal together, we'll, and, I should, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but I'll, I'll go out and find the asset. My team and I will go out and find the asset. We'll put the leverage on it. We'll get the financing. We'll, we'll guarantee the debt, and then we'll invite investment partners to come alongside of us. So local or not, you know, and this has to do with, with working with great teams as well. There's a single family home that I bought back soon after 2009, and I ended up holding that property for probably four or five years. There was a six, six miles from my house. I was only at the property a couple of times. I had somebody do a little fix up for me. A tenant moved in, never met her. Uh, she was paying me $1,200 a month for several years until I moved, until I sold the property, and, and I think almost doubled my money on the property. But the property on the right, is about a thousand miles from my place. And when I really stopped to think about it, the property on the left took more time and energy of my part than the property on the right. The property on the left brought in $1,200 a month. The property on the right brings in between 140 and 150,000 a month. So I was able to scale up without really exerting more time, attention, and energy, mainly because we got great teams on the ground. The, uh, we're gonna talk about some of those teams, the guy on the right there is my team, is on my team, he's my broker, he's the best broker in the city of Memphis. Him and his three-man team are involved in almost, almost half the transactions in multifamily, 20 units or larger, and he's been finding some great deals. The guy on the left is my partner, who is also a property manager and is just very good at what he does. Um, C and B class multifamily can be a tough animal to manage, and uh, You've got to have the right team. We're heavily involved in the ATM space. And here's a partner of mine. It, and you know, we're going to talk about this some more. But when I, I found out I, I can't be the expert at five different um, asset classes. So what I do is I'll go find the experts and I'll try and team up with them. What a lot of us has done this, uh, this weekend by coming here, leveraging um, Sean and Collins. Um, contacts and their uh, deal flow and and there we go. Uh, resort investing. Uh, a bunch of you guys in the room were at the last event in Belize. Um, these are great partners. Uh, we're the lead investor in the resort. We own our investors. I we own about uh, probably 25 percent of the resort. But there's great people involved here, and you know we all know that. Development is um, usually takes longer and it costs more. Um, but the fact that these guys were able to do it in a uh, foreign country uh, makes it even harder. But the fact that they've been able to team up with Hilton, we opened on December 6th as a uh, Hilton collection uh, collection by Curio, and we also part of part of the resort is uh, exclusive to the Time family's Coastal Living. Um, brand. So great partners, great people to do business with, and uh, oh, there are these guys. Anybody know these guys? <laughs> <laughs> you know, probably if I would dedicate the next five years of my life, I could get pretty good at, you know, in this space, but I was like, you know what? Why not leverage? Why not team up? Why not, you know, just why re recreate the wheel? I, you know, I've got a lot of other things going on, as I'm sure most of you in the room do. 
Um, so just to be able to tap into these guys and get great deal flow, and, and not only the deal flow, but uh, I mean, you know, there's a bunch of guys in the room that, who I can't wait to connect with. You know, getting, getting around guys like yourselves through uh, the power of networking and the power of teaming up with the right people. So the winning formula, this is what I found works great for me. Team up with great people, come alongside and partner with them, find ways to add value, get around people smarter than me, that's so far been the easiest. Um, find problems and fix them. You know, most of these guys that I just showed you, uh, the ATM guys, they signed up a massive um, you know, portfolio of ATMs and, and they came to me because they knew that I had a, a network of investors and they had a problem and, and we were able to jump in and, and solve that problem. Here's one of our properties. We, uh, we do a lot of multifamily and, and primarily in Memphis. We own a couple thousand units down there. Typically what we'll do is we'll syndicate properties. So we'll, this was a 373 unit building. We syndicated, the, the investors brought 25% of the equity plus uh, some renovation money. Bank brought 75% of the debt. We purchased this property for $6 million. And I'll give you the little backstory on this property. Uh, it was pretty interesting. This property was owned by an out-of-state investor group. And this, we get access to these properties because of the quality of the team that we work with down there. And I told you about my broker. And, and uh, you know, we have a really good relationship with him. He's gotten us some great deals. This property appraised in August 2015 for $9.2 million. The owners, more than, uh, they invested more than a million dollars in the property in 2015-16. We purchased the property about seven months ago in March of 2017 for $6 million. Um, we just got a, a, a signed LOI this week uh, for just over $10 million in this property. It's not bad for a seven or eight month hold. So how's that for a, I mean, I know it's not a 50 bagger, but come on. I mean. <laughs> All right, ATM investing. ATM investing, uh, strong cash flow, great tax benefits. You got some diversification. It's totally passive, managed by a world-class management team. I'll show you the numbers and how they work. It's a 24.9% cash on cash return. You bring $104,000, buys you a unit. One unit is seven machines. It's on a five-year depreciation schedule, meaning that uh, most of your income in those first five years is, is uh, tax-free. Um, again, prof professionally managed, totally passive. Uh, you know what? Let me just back up here because I got something important to share on this one. So right now, we don't even have ATM units available. but. We are putting a fund together. Uh, some of you guys in the room have tax problems and you think that at the very end of the year you've got some unsolved tax problems. We are planning to, I'm like 95% sure that we're gonna have a section 179. Now this might not be familiar to the foreigners, but to the US investors, it's a big deal. Section 179 means that you can take that whole investment and write it off in the first year. So 24.9% return turns into, if you're in a 40% tax bracket, it can turn into a 65% return, meaning you get 65% of your capital back in the first year. Um, so if you're interested, talk to me about that. We're gonna have, uh, I think, we're gonna have uh, cards dropped off at, at each, one of your, uh, each one of your placements uh, during the break. So that, Dave, is that your end, your end opportunity, the ATM thing? Yes. So right at year end, we usually put this, we actually started putting this fund together for ourselves. And because as you can imagine, the guys that are putting the fund together typically would have tax problems, they don't get strategic. Last year we opened up to, to my investors and, and a bunch of investors came in, but right at the end of the year, if you're doing your, your tax planning, say, let's say you're, you own a couple hundred thousand dollars in tax or you want to really make a dent in your, in your uh, tax liability, could be a good strategy. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, Mahogany Bay Village and the opportunity that exists there. Again, this was where we had last year's um, um, Palisades event. In fact, we sat, a bunch of us sat right out here. It was right out about here. And it was like a board meeting without the boardroom tables and chairs. There was like 12 or 15 of us were sitting in like two foot of water. Such a, it was such a blast. We were, 
going around the circle and, and some of you guys were in that and uh, talking about investments and, and uh, what works and what didn't, it was, it was just a lot of fun. But that's our beach and it goes along with the resort. The numbers, 10 to 12% return on investment on stabilization, it's like a pre-IPO. I mean, you got the chance to own a piece of Hilton before, before we open. And there's also a lot of built-in appreciation. Right now, you can buy a lot for 850,000 with three homes on it. And that lot is um, appraised by a third-party appraisal company by, for 1.4 million. There's a reason for that. There's no financing in the market. And there's also, there's no construction financing in the market. And there's also, you know, not a lot of, not a ton of people have seen it. It's pre-open. Doors open to Hilton on December 6th. Infinite returns in less than four years. We're planning on, because of the, of the appraisal that came in and because of the fact that Hilton's going to, uh, we feel, get that occupancy up quickly, we feel like within four years we'll have, we'll be able to pull all of our investment capital back out of the deal and be an infinite return. This is an office park that we did uh, earlier this year, 42 units. Uh, the deal, 9.3%. I'm just going to show you these. They're, these deals are funded, but I'm, the reason I'm showing them to you is so you can kind of get a feel of what we're doing. And we've got, um, we've got other deals in the pipeline, and we've got, we've got stuff that we're working on. So there's going to be deals in the future. But uh, this deal, 9.3% return on investment immediately. This was unleveraged. So we bought it all cash. We financed return 43% of the investor's capital. Cash on cash return after the financing, this is after we got debt on it, is going to be in the double digits. And the plan is to refinance in five years or less and return all of the investor's capital. Now, when we return all of the investor's capital, it doesn't change anything on the, on the ownership structure. If you own 10% of the deal, and we return all of your capital back, you still own 10% of the deal and you get 10% of the cash flow. Make sense? So this is another deal that we did. It's kind of unusual, but this was, I was a fan of this guy and I read, his, read all his stuff and I and, uh, got on the phone with him one day and he told me about a problem that he had. Uh, this deal, um, this publisher was, was restricting his writing, he was restricting what he, his content and he was also taking a big chunk of the margin. So we were able to put $250,000 together, buy out the publisher, now he can write whatever he wants to write, and now he uh, increased his margin per book by, uh, it went like from, uh, the, the, the publisher was getting $12.50 per book on a $20 book, and now they're getting uh, like around $2 per book, two, two, between two and $3. We got a 1%, our investors got a 1% royalty on gross income for life. Nice little, uh, for you guys that like the royalty streams, uh, and also a lifetime membership on any new products that he writes. Uh, this was a deal, it's a 66 home subdivision, uh, three and four bedroom homes. We bought this property, I was on the front porch out here overlooking the pool yesterday when I got the email that we closed on it. So we just, as of yesterday, we owned this property. 66 single family homes, we bought this for probably less than it costs for the infrastructure. Built in 2004, so they're only 13 years old, we paid 2.26 million for 66 single family homes. Um, it is a long story how we got it to that point, but it's, uh, we're super excited about this property. The way it will perform is, this is what it's performing now. We feel like we can get it better than this. 8.2% cash on cash return, lots of appreciation built in, it's tax sheltered. We typically do what's called a cost segregation study so we can get you a lot of tax free income. This is the kind of deal, and a lot of these are dependable monthly cash flow that you can count on. Here's a land deal that's alive. This is a deal that's alive today. Um, we're getting ready to put this package together. It's gonna be a 20% return on investment, 70% loan to value. And it's a projected 12-month hold, and the investors get a first lien position on the land. So, questions quick. I know I only got like, what I got, one or two minutes? One minute, one or two minutes? Any questions? The, I think the general perception in the room is that real estate's overpriced, and I think you probably share that, but you're still finding opportunity right now? It is overpriced, for the most part. Um, we are being extremely picky and the deal flow is not nearly as strong as what it was two, three, four years ago. But 
what we've found is if you can be in the right place, very similar to some of the deals that, that you've done, if you can be in the right place at the right time with cash, I mean, that's, that's huge. This 66 uh, single family home deal was, uh, they were asking 2.97. We were we went into the bidding. Uh, it was uh, sealed bids. We went into the into the uh, uh, best and final room with four other bidders. We were the lowest. It went under contract for 2.8 million, and it dropped out of contract because of the financing. It came all the way down. They, they actually passed the next couple guys because they also had financing contingencies. It came all the way down to us at 2.26 million, and we were able to get the deal because we were the right place at the right time with the cash. And that, you know, with the cash was a big deal there. So there's still opportunities, they're just harder to find. If you got cash, man, that, if, you got, if you got cash and a great team and a broker that can vouch for you saying, look, these guys went under, they, they purchased, they went to closing on 20 of their last 20 deals that they went under contract with, those two things, cash and a broker that can tell that story is, is where you can get into some really good opportunities. Yeah. Do you have like one or two big funds or do you raise the money in like one-off deals? One-off deals. Every deal is, every time we go out and raise money, it's deal specific. So it's not a fund. Every, we create a separate company and, and, and then we go buy that asset with 10, 15, 20 investors. Um, so typically when we put a deal together, it's based on, on a 75-25 split. 25% goes to the sponsor, the, the uh, management team. So that's our fee for finding the deal, for putting the financing together, for signing on the note. It's another thing that's really important. You can invest in a deal like this. Use leverage. I know, Eric, you mentioned leverage last night. I mean, the, the ultimate goal is to use some form of, form of leverage on the front side and then roll into a non-recourse loan. So for, for that benefit, for the investor to come in and be able to get the benefit of, of levering your money up, um, we, we take 25% of the deal you know, on, uh, on the cash flow side. All right, thank you guys. Think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people? Hit the bid. How violent that term could be? It actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?